Hello everyone, this is DJ. Michal here. And Marco. And this is CG Talks, the podcast where CG guys talk about CG. And in today's episode, we are privileged and honored to have a guest with us, Mr. Aaron Woodford, aka Aaron Dale. Yeah, and um, if you are not uh, really um, familiar with the idea of November and working with Nodes, uh, you can, before listening to the, to the podcast, you can uh, find uh, Curtis Holt video YouTube about uh, November uh, 2020. It's a very cool video, lots of cool examples. You can also download some files ready. And there is some showcase of some artists and the best uh, the best effects of the of this year, November. So it's a very cool introduction to this topic. Okay, so first maybe let's uh, let's let our guest introduce himself to our audience. So here's some yeah. place for you. <laughs> My name is Aaron. Uh, I run a YouTube channel called Aaron Dale and. I have a Discord server as well that I run with another YouTuber called Just 3D Things. Um, and we are like completely focused on proceduralism, pr primarily with Blender, but we cover a lot more software as well. But most of us are kind of Blender users. Um, I've been using Blender since I was, I don't know, 12 or 13. So maybe wow. more than half my lifetime. But uh, yeah, just getting really into the proceduralism in the last kind of year 18 months and uh yeah just trying to make that kind of a bit of a business model so yeah that's that was one of the that's first questions really i wanted cool. to to ask you about uh, how you got to use blender because you know right now you're probably most recognizable to people online as the node magician doing the <laughs> november <laughs> crazy stuff that's that's really awesome and uh i was wondering whether uh, like, like how you started really going for Blender, like what was your incentive to start doing this and what was your first maybe gigs on gigs in Blender? Yeah. Because so it was not, I, not, not always notes, right? Yeah, not always. No, notes has been pretty recent for me, actually. So I, I mean, I started it when I was quite young, but I came from like, um, I think it was like Pro Desktop back in the day. It's like a kind of CAD tool. Um, that we were just using at school. And then I started wanting to make games. And so that was like, obviously a much more, I don't know, you, you want to be going much more down like poly modeling rather than surface and solids. Um, so I just got into Blender then and that was like 2.49. So back when it was like the bottom bar and it, everything was right click select. So yeah yeah that's I, I feel strange. i feel kind of yeah, related to that because that, <laughs> that's the version i started with blender oh no way <laughs> oh man i yeah. feel like such a like such, i feel so spoiled because like i <laughs> i really got into it in like two two point seven i think yeah uh, before yeah, that kind you're of lucky lucky all, so. lucky boy so lucky <laughs> and there's so many more resources now as well for learning like yeah way back for like two point four nine it was just like t good luck. You just you muddle your way through, but then yeah, now we've got so many like great tutorial makers like CG Matter. He's just pumping out tutorials like every day at the moment. But yeah, yeah, really insane. Guy. Yeah, but like my kind of direction with three D has been uh, kind of steered in quite a few directions. I went to uni for uh, computer animation and visualization but I only did that for a year because I was like oh I just I don't know if I want to do animation and then I ended up like training as a cabinet maker and completely giving up on 3D for a few years um, and then I came back to it so I did an interior design degree as well so interiors is my background um, and then I was working with a studio and just like the more real like real world interior design stuff that I was doing, the more where I was like, ah, you, you, obviously you do the visuals for your schemes and then you have all of the steps after that that you have to actually go to get it built. And I was just really enjoying doing the visuals and getting the design work done on that side. And Blender was becoming more and more uh, kind of feasible for me, I guess. And especially with the 2.8 release, 
it just kind of launched it forwards into um, popularity as well. It just shows how much of an improvement the UI change was. Um, so yeah, and just like I finished my degree this summer and kind of just have gone into Blender now, just staying 100% Blender. All the way. Yeah. Uh, this is, now this is a natural start for, for 2D um, for anybody, Blender. Like uh, you want to check if you like it, then Blender is way to go. And if you get hooked, then you stay with it because it's uh, good enough and many, many things better. So I recently checked the, uh, the searches for 3ds Max tutorial and for like five years, it's just, just a steady, steady uh, going down and the Blender is going up. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is pretty. It seems pretty strange because, like, if you go uh, searching for a job, for example, in a in an RV studio or whatever of this kind, the, then you get 3ds Max as the main package. Yeah, but this is, I think, it's it's also changing because of the game dev taking over so much of the 3D market. Like, it's it's totally a different world, uh, the the game creation thing, yeah. and it's so much more open. And that whole generation who just started with Blender now, it's, I think it's like millions of people who just started with Blender and they, they have no, no reason to, to, to skip to Max or Cinema 4D really. Yeah, I find, because I, I've got a Discord server and I think the Discord general user base is a little bit younger. Um, and it's so crazy when you've got people turning up and they're like, yeah, I'm 11. And it's like, you've wow. been using Blender for, like, you've been alive for less time than I've been using Blender. <laughs> that's just such a crazy thought. And they're obviously that's super into Blender now. And the skill level is going up and up and up. And, like, just want to shout out some people. Like, Gabe, his work is ridiculous. And he's quite young. And then we've got, like, Ben, BBN, BBBN19. His work is just, like, absolutely ridiculous. And they're pushing and pushing and pushing. But they're super young guys. So it's just like amazing to see the stuff that people are coming out with now. Yeah, the, yeah that's... which makes me feel so old sometimes. <laughs> yeah, really. But... Yeah, but but I'm honestly really happy uh, to see Blender where it is today. I mean, I remember having conversations with people at work or or anyone else who was doing 3D um, that I knew. And uh, sorry about the noise, by the way. It's been... But um, yeah, uh, I kind of. I kind of sort of recall always getting this almost, um, I don't know, I mean, that, this almost kind of patronizing kind of like, oh, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's great, but I mean, you'll, it'll never be an industry standard and you probably never <laughs> get a job, but yeah, I mean, Blender's cool, I guess. But, yeah. you know, now it's just, it's, just, it's just really nice to see how sophisticated it's become. How robust it's become and how accessible it is to everyone and that anyone like someone aged 11 or younger can just pick it up and and yeah feel safe like moving around it having you know other more experienced people kind of helping them uh learn the ropes yeah do you find that your uh like your experience with blender knowing that people used to for a really long time kind of look down on it and it was always just like oh it's fine it's just a stepping stone to maya or 3ds or you know whatever other platform yeah like you when you share it yeah, yeah when, when you tell people that you're a blender user or that that's like your career is based around blender do you do that with um a bit of like a hesitancy that they're just going to be like hmm okay not really to be honest like i've always kind of I've always kind of really, um, I don't know. I, I've always kind of really felt strongly about it because, like I said, like I've I've tried a bit of like the, um, the Autodesk stuff and Cinema 4D, and it just I was really sort of like starting out, looking to make animated shorts. So I just needed something that, um, I guess like there's, uh, I, I forget I forget who said that, but um someone someone uh like one of the the blender the figureheads in the blender community said something along the lines of blender being like a really good swiss knife or something like that 
like I I don't recall who said that exactly, but I I I totally agree, and that's why that's why I love it. I mean, I've always kind of felt that that's sort of the kind of that's sort of the program I need to be immersing myself in something that uh, will allow me to bust out, you know, and add like a a full scene um, that that doesn't crash on me every, you know, that I don't spend fifty percent of like my energy and time learning how to troubleshoot because of all of these little things that get in the way and even mm. in the earlier versions of blender i mean well early i, I mean 2.7 in my case but <laughs> you know even then like it really it felt super stable i loved that um i would uh work on jobs when where like everybody need to kind of go to an office uh and then we just use the computers that like the 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 head of like a a production crew would set up in a room and um, there'd be like, uh, yeah, like the the standard installed like Max or Maya, but then I'd always have my little USB where I could make Blender <laughs> from and just and just work on that, you know. And I I really yeah I love that. Just it just it just felt so liberating, and I'm I'm yeah I'm I'm mm-hmm. glad that like um, yeah not that I've ever really um, been apprehensive about like telling anyone I was using Blender, but now it's like, it's a, you can kind of say it with a, and, and not expect, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not expect anyone to kind of, uh, you know, not expect the same kind of reactions. It's like everyone now is just like, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know. Hmm. Uh, it I still needs it. a little more time to be professional tool because for example, on farm, on farm, we mostly have majorities, 2ds Max jobs. Then I think, for some time it was my app and then there was this complication with Arnold and and Cinema 4D. So Blender is rather in minority right now. It's like mm. on the end of the list. But I think this is a matter of time. Like this wave is going to reach the I think the professional production as well. Now I mean as when I look at what guys are doing with Blender it's uh I think it's inevitable. So I was thinking. So why why did you move to proced- uh, procedural workflow? What was the the reason? Actually, yeah, uh, that's yeah. So I was. Oh, it's really difficult to like pinpoint the thing that started it. There was just like at some point I was suddenly really really into it. I think I was working on. Um, so I was coming into my final year of my degree of interior design, um, and I've always kind of pushed towards doing slightly more abstract or um, kind of experimental schemes. And I just, I think I just started looking at kind of computational design and how computers can sort of like the industry 4.0 movement and how we can start to kind of automate systems and how you can start looking at a computer as more of a design partner and something that you're collaborating with as opposed to a tool that you are using uh, as like a servant to you um, and just like doing research and my uh, my final essay dissertation was about computational design and how mm-hmm. kind of architecture and engineering have and construction actually as well because of things like the oh there's a unity tool that allows you to have like real-time AI um augmented reality overlays so that you can like go around a building site and you can check things how they're going to actually fit on site Mm -hmm. um but there's yeah yeah, i was just like doing loads of research into how people can be using and uh, like there's so much interesting architecture out there as well so like the one i always end up coming back to is the bull ring in birmingham which is this it's by uh, a firm called arup and it's this big kind of freeform shell but it's covered in circle kind of chrome discs and it's just a really impressive building just kind of i I think a lot of people look at it with um as a bit of an eyesore because it's not a conventional building but the more i knew about it and the more that it was like oh so that's how it got designed and like all of the things about the circle packing and the way that it was like requiring computers to make it there's like there was no way that a person could have made that within like a mm-hmm. reasonable amount of time and it's just like this whole world of design that got opened up because of computers and the the way that computers think about things 
as opposed to humans. So like humans have um, like creative reasoning where you come up with an, an idea and then you go on to the next one and you go on to the next one. And it's like branching, whereas computers have deductive reasoning where you have all of the solutions to begin with and then you filter them. So it's like coming at a design problem from two different sides. And if you mm -hmm. can leverage what a computer can do through proceduralism or parametric design, then you're able to free up the human for doing the design tasks that the human is good at. So I think that was like the really inspiring thing that I found about it, kind of coming as, coming as a designer to it. Oh, so, you know, I'm, 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 I'm watching, I'm looking at this building and uh, this is something which is very easy to, to, to draw with a pencil. Like the first year student would probably do this like mm -hmm. uh, as one of the first ideas. But it is very complicated to translate it into thousands of elements aligned in a uh, you know, very precise, precise, uh, precise way. Yeah. That I remember. I remember because I studied studied like let's say quote and quote exterior architecture, mm -hmm. and the uh, the architects who were teaching us they were kind of. Uh, kind of uh, warning us uh, against doing this kind of stuff like years ago. <laughs> because, I mean, th there were several several reasons. One of them was that um, it is like a, a very... Uh, you could go through albums with fantastic architecture and a lot of it is like the constructivist architecture very, very appealing and the, those monumental build buildings like... Uh, like uh, let's say Norman Foster or mm -hmm. like this uh, this this these landmarks, and they very often are just very original. And the architects were teaching us, okay, guys, yeah, yeah, you can try doing that. And very often it was a failure. But uh, you know, guys, learn how to use a normal uh, construction to and do it beautiful rather than have some abstract idea and then to try to try to somehow uh you know assume okay guys will build it right from concrete they will just mm -hmm. ju do just do this and yeah but now when you 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 are saying that this is this is like uh this is actually a in a way constructivist building when you are using these old tools all mathematical mathematical tools all these uh modeling tools to to build it but i remember it was uh it was like uh Everyone wanted to be the best architect on the world, but not everybody was so much prone to learn how to just uh, design a decent <laughs> house, right? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, but that's yeah. also that's also probably you know just just the struggle with, uh, of some new ideas with the old ideas of the professors. <laughs> like mm. I found when I was doing my studies, I've I've had some ideas about things that are kind of similar to to modern, like this. Um, you know, upcycling ideas, uh, using like old junk to create new stuff. And generally in the upcycling type of thinking mm -hmm. of creating new objects. And then I was kind of warned that, <clears throat> that it's, it's like it's a, little bit, a little bit dangerous, you know, maybe it will just turn out to be a, you know, a junkyard thing <laughs> uh, instead of design. And then a few years later, when my generation kind of, kind of came to the mainstream, <laughs> It, it it became like a trend, right? So, uh, loft stuff and yeah, generally upcycling uh, upcycling old, old stuff to create new objects and mm -hmm. it's like a huge trend in in the interior design. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just the way things go in the world. By by the way, like when I started study architecture, the the there was you know the CG was very crappy and we had mm. like. Programs like At Atlantis and maybe Three Days Max with some scanline. It was uh, it was really not a very good idea to visualize your work with computer. So we mm. only drew, we learned how to sketch, draw, and stuff like that. And uh, and we built a lot of models. And I at some point I went through some also you know this this uh, degrees works from eighties at my at my university. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, okay, these guys really played around with 3D form. Like o o almost every, I mean, it was also 80s, but almost all, all everything was from like a white concrete or very simple materials. And then like years after that, I, I 
uh, talked to one of my professors and I watched the exhibition of some new works from, from let's say, year 2000. And all the works were visualized in computers, like almost all of them. And the professor was kind of uh, surprised. He said, I have a lot of very mature students right now. They, they use materials in such a mature way. And I was thinking, yeah, of course. Like if you can make a visualization of a building from a steel or aluminum, or you can, and you can show your idea, then you are going to do this. You, it was very difficult to draw some of the materials. I mean, it was limiting you. Like mm -hmm. you can, of course, say, make an arrow. This is steel, right? But if you yeah. want to present this idea that and and how, what, what this building is about, then you you need to be able to to show it like without uh, without any description. And mm -hmm. because people very often played around from the start in 3ds Max with the, their designs. And they were just dropping shaders, like even you know, downloaded <laughs> from from internet. Okay, that looks bad. That looks bad. That looks cool. And yeah, all of a sudden, like there's 20 designs on a year with 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 very cool materials used. Like like these guys were already architects for years. Mm -hmm. So that that the the way that you can see it actually affected the 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 boundaries of what people could do and 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 uh, what decision they make also definitely i think um that's like a really important point about designing because you like so many people design on paper i mean even now people like are educated to design on paper that's my whole degree was like don't come at us with visuals come at us yeah. with drawings don't bring visuals until the end but i just because i'm quite quick at doing visuals i think that they just say that because it's like we don't want you to get bogged down in the software if you're yeah. using vectorworks or revit or autocad or whatever then it's easy to get and especially if you're new to the software as well like it's so easy to get like i know i want this shape but i can only make cubes so that's it's going to be cubes whereas like for me obviously using blender which is much more free form then you know like if, if i wanted to go in and sculpt something then that's an option where it isn't in like revit so if i like if i can come in and start doing a visual and start looking at something in materiality really early then i can scratch something off and be like actually that design didn't work or maybe i should push like that direction more because it's something which actually seems to work even though my sketch on paper didn't necessarily look very good because it didn't have any of that materiality it didn't show any of the lighting or anything so it, it feels and especially now that we've got Eevee doing real time and there's other platforms so like if you're using twin motion or enscape there's like other real-time rendering applications that like really speed up the design kind of design review process i guess mm -hmm. yeah the concept this the constant thing phase is kind of more interactive than it used to be. Yeah. You know, we talked about also this, uh, like you said, that uh, your teachers didn't want you to start from working 3ds Max, but also, I mean, in, in 3D uh, app. But this is also kind of a constraint. Like at first, like you, you do, you doodle in the space which is the easier to work work with. So if you started to work with AutoCAD, you would probably come up with some square building. Because this is the space where you can play around. Mm. In the space where this is kind of tough, you you are not experimenting and doodling. This is not possible. So you kind of naturally go to this freedom space. And I, I remember, like my professors were also anti three D. Like uh, I mean, in terms of starting work, like okay, guys, start to with sketches. Don't show us the the the, the computer renders that render mm. stuff like that. Um, yeah, but on the, on the, on the other, so, so you don't constrain your freedom and, uh, and you will not come up with some kind of similar ideas, but on the other hand, I think they were kind of happy because, um, uh, for example, in general, we were supposed to design, work on the model, like, you know, cut out it from, from paper, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and not a lot of people were doing that because we are just lazy kids. so <laughs> so we, we you know the the you did the model like night before the the, the <laughs> deadline and um 
And because of, of 3D apps, people actually started playing with like with basically like building blocks like kids. Mm. So it was like easier to to put together some interesting space, some interesting places in your building uh, from the various point of view. And that was like, I don't think that the professors were, were really so much aware at first uh, that we are doing this naturally with these programs because of all people use them. Mm-hmm. And that in a way, like it was easier than, than to work with glue and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, that, 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 I think that had a positive, uh, positive uh, impact. Yeah, but I think that it's really interesting what you said about uh, using the computer as a partner in design, like uh, because we are talking about uh, traditionally designing things out of your head or of your ideas, sketches and stuff. When you come out with your own kind of uh, things that you get from reality and things that you come up uh, with, and then the computer is really a tool of visualizing. Uh, structures that are mathematically built like you 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 really tend to invent the way the system works and the system creates Mm. uh kind of ideas for you right yeah things like maybe i don't know if you've uh, had uh, um, played with uh the tissue add-on i hope yeah by so i think he's uh, like the creator of it uh, has some experience in grasshopper Mm. or for rhino as well and it's kind of a similar thing to sphere talk as well. I think that you've you've made something some some things with sphere talk, sphere talk as well in Blender. I have, yeah, I've used uh, Grasshopper for a bit as well. Actually, I um I ended up not getting on with Grasshopper because of um, because of Rhino. I don't know. Maybe this is like a bit. I always end up talking down about Rhino because I just never got on with it. Although it is a very um like fully featured application it's very powerful and i know it certainly has its place but i think for like for my workflow i wanted to move away from solids and surfaces so coming into blender and having access to svirchok was amazing and then you you like you can be doing stuff in svirchok and you can make your whole system and then you can be rendering it in eevee in real time so you can do this like incredible thing but then you can also see it with all of its materials on which is just like, I don't know, it's nuts. So, but I think um, having the computer to offer you these sort of novel ideas, I think is really powerful because one of the really powerful things about sketching is that you haven't, like sketching by hand, like with pen and pencil, you don't really define an explicit idea. Like you can, mm-hmm. I can't, can't remember who said it. It was like, if you draw a circle, you convey the idea of circularity, but you you haven't drawn like an exact circle at an exact size, but somebody looking at it knows that it's like, that's a, that's a circle. Mm-hmm. And that's like, that's a really powerful thing about sketching because you can do your, like your sketch phase of your concept and you've not actually said like, okay, this is exactly where this door goes and this is exactly where this light fitting mm-hmm. is because you've got, you've got like the vagueness to sort yeah. of built into the sketch. And I think that, with 3D, obviously, if you put a door in, it's very easy just to be like, well, that's where the door is now. Mm-hmm. Even if you haven't actually designed it, even if it was just like a placeholder. But I think with procedural systems, you're sort of building in that kind of allowable vagueness again, because it's not that you're necessarily, like you can define loads of stuff by a random seed. So you might look at one outcome and be like, okay, well, that is exactly what that is. But then you can immediately generate a hundred or a thousand more options. So you mm-hmm. kind of, you get that flexibility back. So, I think so this is for you, right? Because like, let's say layman or your clients, the clients have a rarely ability to understand that this is work in progress. Like even yeah. if you said it 1000 times, okay, so this is just, I want to show that just this thing and we didn't do the, I don't know, the colors and then Mm. the guys watching that and okay, but the colors are bad. And yeah, (laughs) I just said that Yeah, like people are just taking it as it is. I um, uh, there's a viewport mode in Blender, which it randomly colors everything. And it's, it's just like a modeling aid so that you can see the difference between different objects. mm -hmm. And I made the mistake of sending a client just like 
but with explicitly being like this is this has no materials no lighting this is explicitly mm-hmm. just the massing of the space just the massing and they came back and they were like yeah i'm just not really sure about the colors <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah not. This is, uh, <laughs> yeah so that's why drawing is is uh cool because i think that people uh if you show them a uh, hand uh hand uh sketch I think they they would be much more uh, they would be understand that this is like a sketch, mm-hmm. so they would wouldn't say but where are the materials because the sketch is like a, like a you know a, by default it's a, a, like the, the general idea and I think that people who are not into any kind of uh, design or arts they understand it that you mm-hmm. like okay this is going to okay they understand that this is just. Uh, some some i don't know how to call it like uh it's not it's not one to one yeah yeah suggestion yeah this is the this, that media is about that so they don't take it too seriously mm. so I, I was thinking that you know you you went into procedural work and uh does it does it require some kind of skills or let's say talent or way of thinking uh or imagination that like it's different from traditional modeling and 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 texturing like this is something that maybe uh promotes some skills that that people have this kind of working but maybe also at the same time it may be hard for some people to to uh to learn it or to really really use it in a creative way i think yeah definitely i mean it's I think people look at it and they think that's this is too much maths, so I'm not mm-hmm. going to touch it. Um, but like I've not touched maths since school, and I didn't, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't do a maths degree. I didn't do any maths after, and I did reasonably fine, like kind of middle of the road at school in maths. So I don't think maths is like actually a the maths that you use when making procedural systems is generally quite simple, and also once you know why you do a certain bit of maths that's it like it's in the bank then like if Mm -hmm. as soon as you get told like okay if you put a range of values through cosine and sine and then you put the sine into the x and the cosine into the y it's going to draw a circle and then that's it Mm -hmm. it's like you don't really need to understand the trigonometry you just need to know that this tool does this thing Mm -hmm. and then it's then you're done with that but i think the the key thing about building procedural systems is and it is slightly different between procedural textures that we're seeing a lot for November and procedural modeling, which is mm-hmm. kind of the, I don't know, I, kind of, I, I rate procedural modeling much higher than textures because at the end of the day, if I'm doing client work, I'll use image textures. I'll just buy some, like I'll go on Polygon or something and I'll grab some actual high resolution PBR textures because you're not always, but most of the time going to get a much better result and a much better uh, kind of idea of that material that way. Proceduralism is super powerful for textures, but I think uh, for like time constraints and things, is you're better off just using PBR textures. But in terms of modeling, I think that's when it's really powerful because you can create a system and then your client can come back and say, I don't like this, or I want there to be five instead of three. And then you just mm-hmm. change a slider instead of having to remodel the whole thing. So we'll see mm-hmm. like being non destructive is, is really good. But the way that you think about that problem then has to change because it's not like I need this thing here. So mm-hmm. you make that thing there. Like you may be designing your system around a specific outcome, but then build flexibility into that system so that you can do variations. But I think the it's it's all about list management and I suppose data management as well. So you're not really thinking like oh this extrusion here it's like these vertices in this region and how do i manipulate this list and i think that's that's the part of procedural modeling that is completely different is all of the stuff about doing list operations and this is the same between svirchok and grasshopper things like grafting and flattening lists is that's like a whole skill set that you don't touch unless you're doing procedural modeling but yeah, I think it's kind of kind of similar to building really software systems because right, it's, yeah. it's really data management to some extent, right? 
I've not actually really done any programming, but I, whenever I talk to people about this, they're always like, oh yeah, this is exactly the same as when doing this like work in C and it's like, okay. So we are essentially just programming, but with vis visual, I mean, it's a visual programming language, so. Yeah, but you know, like for example, before, before uh, procedural CG, there was a, uh, electric guitars with boxes with effects you just would plug one after another and <laughs> yeah. the guys who were playing them the best were not really math geniuses i would say mm. this who i knew and they they got it like just they got the feel of what this is doing of course like theoretical knowledge about what kind of waves you have like this sinus waves or this uh square waves whatever that would mm -hmm. would help but a lot of people would just feel into it, just play yeah. around and they just operate it at this level. So I don't know if the sound is, is smart, it's easier to, 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 to do in this intuitive way than image maybe. Like, I, for example, I was thinking, uh, I played with some uh, Mandelbulb. So, mm -hmm. so I watched Mandelbulb renders, some fantastic, you know, this, this really cool, uh, like, up. Uh, this Mandelbulb is the 3D, 3D fractal. Yeah, so but this is 3D and this is producing uh this is producing uh, uh the fractal fractal models which are basically uh yeah and they're uh, they're rendered really there is that ab adaptive let's say adaptive subdivision and they they look very cool like there are those camera fly throughs and it looks like this is some build with some strange civilization mm -hmm. because this is on the way, on one way, it is like construction. On the other way, it's very organic. So this is mm. okay. I don't know. These guys evolved from wasps or something. And actually, uh, from recently, you can export Mandelbulb 3D model to other applications. It was not possible for a very long time. Of course, it's going to be like uh, there is going to be simplified. Like mm -hmm. the the whole power of the Mandelbulb is that this is really adaptive uh, calculating of the geometry depending on where your camera is. Yeah. But you can export. That was for me. That was very interesting. To, uh, okay, fine. I can do this image in the software, but can I use it in my like work in 3ds Max? Now you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, for me the problem was that when I played around with the settings, uh, only very small, only very small, uh, like a set of settings will, were g giving any results. Most of the settings are creating some complete let's say one big uh one big uh, artifact like a uh, okay. of settings create like a point and that's it and it was it was it, it was difficult uh to you know like what like it would be cooler if all the settings from 0 to 100 were given some kind of effects like i can move around but it was like most of the decisions that's, random that's because around. you didn't have yeah. the constraint set up like correctly because uh, it's it's really it really comes down to a mathematical formula and it has yeah. its limitations probably so yeah i was i was thinking that i don't get to, mathematics <laughs> to parameters yeah, yeah so i, I guess the, if you get a pretty complicated node setup for blender without uh, the proper values exposed then you mm -hmm. get confused as well and <laughs> produce crazy stuff i was trying to dip my fingers into into the november this year and really felt like a <clears throat> like there were procedural artists and i'm just a noob procedural artist <laughs> so to speak uh -huh. so yeah it it gets complicated once you know more nodes get convoluted in the whole process mm -hmm. so i was thinking that Aaron, maybe let's say that that if somebody is just a raster artist traditional 3 ds max no procedurals what would be the best software to start to in, to kind of incorporate procedural to your workflow, just a general workflow uh, to start with. Because like, for example, I admire Houdini animations, but this is like, a, that would be such a huge pill to swallow to just do anything. Like, I think most of people are scared with mathematics and coding. Yeah. So what would be the like a very uh, natural step to, I... to start with? I mean, I feel bad about saying Houdini now, but, but Houdini, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so powerful. That's the thing, like if you're going to learn the, the platform to, to be able to do anything really, you can, you can look at Houdini and uh, 
the first hour is going to be agony, but mm-hmm. after that you're going to be fine because it's there. There are like all of the stops and things, and especially the new version of Houdini is. I don't know if any of you caught the keynote on the new release. I think it's eighteen point five or yeah. something. Yeah, we and had like, a bit the sneak rigging bit stuff. Crazy. So, like, they're obviously moving in new directions with their software, um, and obviously it's really expensive if you buy a full license, but then you can get the indie license, or you can learn it with the apprentice license for free. Um, and it, I guess it depends what you're doing as well. Like, if you're just wanting procedural shaders, then I would probably say Substance Designer, mm-hmm. because it's like a nice mix of uh, kind of procedural and non-procedural, like the the samples and things that you can load in are kind of, it starts off with non-procedural assets that you can then do procedural operations onto. Um, and also that's very artist orientated. So I think this is the problem that a lot of people coming to uh, proceduralism in Blender have is you, in Blender you're doing everything super low level. Like if you want to mirror something, you've got to do it with the maths. If you want to tile something, you've got to do it with the maths. And it's easy once you know what the functions are that you need to do it. But unless you know what the functions are, you're not going to know. Um, mm-hmm. So, and compare that to substance when it's just like, okay, I want to mirror it, so I'm going to add the mirror, or I want to do some kind of distortion. And so, and you, the way that you think about it in substance is very much the order that you think about it as an artist. You're like, okay, I want this thing, and then I want it to be mirrored. Whereas in Blender, you say, I want this thing, and now I want it to be mirrored, so I have to go before the thing and mirror the coordinate space um so it's it's kind of a it depends how you go about thinking it because blender is very much like we're just going to give you the bare bones and you're going to just work it out and that gives you more freedom like you can take it further if you know how if you're really good at that stuff but at the same time it's gone much higher like kind of threshold for entry um and i guess like if you're wanting to starting if you're wanting to start incorporating proceduralism into your workflow, most platforms, I think, have their own procedural systems. Like I know um, Maya now has Bifrost, which looks super powerful. And obviously if you're using uh, AutoCAD, I think that's got its own um, procedural systems that you can use. I can't remember the name of it. I think Revit does as well. And 3DS, I feel like 3DS does have something um but it has a handful those. of shaders <laughs> does it not have a procedural modeling interface or platform i have never checked it like oh, that okay. was so i'm so new to this like <laughs> i i just somewhere maybe seen some stuff like that but like creators plugins who are kind of procedural but mm-hmm. they are just you know creators but that, that that's surprising for me what you said about Houdini and Blender because I thought it's just like a opposite way around that that Houdini is like you have this command line okay now go you have all the maths and this and you can do whatever you want but in the Blender you have like more like uh, yeah options like plugins okay you can do uh, procedural I know net with this option mm. something like that I think for for Svirchok, which is um. Svetrok is Russian for cricket, so it's kind of a a parallel with Grasshopper. Um, but that certainly has a lot of tools in it which are kind of explicitly like, okay, I need a brick wall, so I'm gonna use the brick wall generator and things like that. But you know, that's like a third party add-on. And whereas mm-hmm. if you look at what Blender's doing, and now with geometry nodes as well, I think the angle that they're taking is much more like we're gonna expose how you can do things on like a fundamental low level Mm -hmm. and if you want to take that then that is then your kind of prerogative you can you can go and generate stuff because you have the low level building blocks whereas systems that come in and they're like we're going to give you high level stuff but only a few of them Mm -hmm. you're then restricted to just those high level building blocks yeah Yeah. that's kind of like the experience i had uh, with uh, learning a software for making procedural plans uh, the plant factory okay uh i i tried to create plans with it and yeah for the first the first month of learning was really a hard hard like learning curve mm-hmm. but then 
you know, once you get a hang of the main functions and the, and the idea how they work, you can really get far with it. And it's kind of like a pretty much constrained uh, tool designed specifically for plants. So it's like limiting your creative abilities, just giving you the nodes that you really need for plants in particular. Mm -hmm. So for, for each part of the plant, you have a specific node and, and some parameters exposed to you. Mm -hmm. And that's really helping to like go in that particular direction, but not really letting you create anything with it, right? Just yeah. like you have the power with uh, Houdini, for example, or, or possibly with Blender and Geometry Nodes in the future. Yeah, I mean, even now with, um, I've seen in, even just like the last few days, I've seen a lot of people using uh, like animation nodes. That's another procedural uh, system for Blender. Um, and that's, you can do things like, they're called L systems. They're like branching systems, essentially making plants, right? So you can, so yeah, like using, it was Plant Factory, did you say? That's, that's like a specifically catered to making plants. And I'm sure it's really good at making plants, but that's fine until you don't want to make plants. Whereas if you were to learn how to make, you know, fractal systems in Sverjok or animation nodes, then you could make anything that had branching, mm -hmm. any kind of like branching logic in it. Um, and I think just going back to a point that you mentioned earlier, Michael, uh, about having a system that with, with the mandel bulbs, you were saying that you were having loads of issues with certain settings not actually giving you, they were giving you like null outputs. Mm -hmm. So if you were to have something that was able to like intelligently look at its own output and decide whether or not it was like a satisfactory output, that's something that you can start building into kind of more intelligent systems. I think that's where proceduralism is going now with like machine learning becoming much more accessible to people. You can start giving it like suitability um, criteria essentially, and it will compare its output against the criteria and see whether or not it fails it. And if it wants to do another one, and like in its simplest form, you can think of this as like if you have, uh, so like if you would have a three D model and you wanted to put it in the smallest box possible, by just like rotating so that the box is constrained to x y z axes, then you can rotate the object. Then it will just like rotate the object as many times as it can until it finds that that box is no longer getting smaller, and then it will tell you that that is the final output, rather than mm -hmm. give you every option for how the object could rotate and saying how big the box is, it will just say, this is the one that is most suitable. <laughs> so if you can design a system that has suitability criteria in it and a way of assess like self-assessing, then you can start really leveraging proceduralism to take your, to take a lot of pressure off you as a designer and give you like the freedom to then be a designer. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, I was thinking that uh, when, for example, when you, you learn CG, like 3D, 3D art, mm -hmm. um, one of, I mean, there are, there's computer, but also you need to kind of figure out some stuff about reality. Like, for example, uh, I don't know, what is GI as opposed to direct lighting, let's say. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the same thing, but uh, there is that difference. Or, for example, you get a skill of looking at the material and you know what components are building it like reflections glossy reflections uh this diffuse and stuff like that and i was thinking that this procedural thing is that i mean it, it would be I, I, I of course i watched this 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 video which i said about uh, at the at the start mm -hmm. and some pe people are getting very specific uh, results like uh no man and i, I just <laughs> i just un don't understand how they did it but a lot of the stuff this is organic stuff which is uh like maybe not organic like a horse but this this kind of between living nature and dead nature mm -hmm. and uh i think you need to figure out with those tools with those um procedural tools and simple let's say math maybe not even like going very deep into math how the world physical world like is, is built with because this is like the the nature of the like for example there was this 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 asteroid like this is a very good example like mm -hmm. this is how nature 
is working this this uh, on some level i mean randomness on many levels and yes the, the, that i guess you i guess you doing this kind of stuff like sun for example like okay i can see a smoke pattern there or something like that mm-hmm understand uh, understand these kind of rules of of physical world before yeah. you before you start doing uh, like um like you look at the asteroid okay there's a lot of holes but now what's the what's the rule behind this 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 particular shape yeah i think that's like one of the key points of proceduralism is that you know you can just fake it you can just say okay i need holes here here and here to make it look mm-hmm. like this thing but then if you do that then you're restricted to just having holes there there and there because you've said like okay this is where they are but mm-hmm. if you think about it it's more of like a real procedural i mean like nature is like the most procedural system so mm-hmm. if, if you think about like how like what processes have gone on to result in that thing yeah then you're able to build a system that is much more kind of reflective of that although it does mean that it's much harder for you to get a specific outcome. Like I think if you were to look at a lot of, um, like even just like this month with November, if you look at any of the results that are relying on kind of noise or random Mm -hmm. inputs, if you were to go and ask that person to make a specific version and you were to give them an explicit drawing of what you wanted it to look like, I think they'd find it a lot more difficult because that Mm -hmm. system is not really... It it becomes a lot more difficult to say like, and especially especially with noise and things where it's like you're not really defining the constraints so much as you are just being like have some randomness. It's not for copying for for sure. Like yeah, it's for creating from scratch. Uh, like the general like yeah, this is this is funny. Like the the there is an asteroid thing and. Uh, one thing is that you create it from scratch, you take some reference. But on the other hand, everybody has in, in, in their head the general idea of asteroid. Mm-hmm. And you just create a one which was never there, but everybody would say, okay, that's asteroid. That's yeah. uh, maybe even a real one. So, yeah. I, mm, I, I, I kind of uh, kind of think that you know, this is this procedural thing is good for people who have like I'm. I don't want to like scare off people saying that little scientists in their head because <laughs> like artists would say, okay, no, no, I'm not going to go there. But exper like a experimentator there, like mm-hmm. you do like to do experiments. Well, uh, in this case, visual ones. I yeah, but know, I think that that's pretty close to an artistic mindset as well. If you're open, kind of to. Like the happy accidents when yeah. you while you're working. I think for artists it's a really powerful tool. I, even if you're not in 3D necessarily, right? Like even if you're just a concept artist or something, having the ability to like automatically generate any kind of reference material that you want. Or like if you want to have like a, a new idea for a town and to just like to get out of the habitual way that you work. And I think like everybody builds habits in the way that they work. And especially when you're put up against time constraints, it's like, okay, I'm going to do this because I know I can do it in four hours Mm -hmm. rather than experiment for two days. Mm -hmm. And if you can have a system that is like, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to generate the new idea starting point for you. Then you can do all of your rendering and whatever you need to do on top of that. Or just like, even just use it as a launching off point, like as a, kind of as an idea generator i think that's so powerful for artists and yeah definitely to not be afraid of coming into proceduralism thinking that it's too mathematical or too like logic based because a lot of it is just like you could just feel your way through it really you have an idea for something that you want and even if the tool isn't like explicitly exposed in how it works you can like there's enough content out there now to just kind of google it when there's enough people like my discord server has nearly 1200 people now specifically people who are interested in proceduralism so every time anybody has a problem it's like they can just go on there and like two minutes later somebody has come up with a solution for you so it's a really quick way of getting feedback now and there are like there are loads of communities online and obviously all of like the github forums and the developer chats and things 
so there's so much kind of available knowledge so definitely to not be afraid of entering this kind of world of proceduralism mm -hmm. so basically i now in the point of uh hollywood policeman who said that i'm old i'm too old for that <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yeah talking about time constraint and working against time constraint i just wanted to ask you Aaron, uh, about how you managed to, how you managed to survive no november really <laughs> Barely. <laughs> finding balance, I don't know, work, work and life balance or stuff like oh, that. I mean, just the idea of balance is nice, I guess. I remember there was a time that that happened, but not for this month. <laughs> I think it's, I mean, I have turned away paid work this month just so I can focus on this, um, which I, I told somebody that and they were a bit like, oh, are you, was that a good idea? But I think like as a, I'm using it as an audience building exercise. So I am putting in quite a lot of time to make uh, like time lapses and I've done a few tutorials and I'm going to do a couple more tutorials, I think. And then obviously doing like the simple shaders are like two hours. And then I did like, there was one of the prompts that I did like an animated hair, like a rabbit animal and a butterfly. And it was just like, that was like 10 hours. So there's like this huge variation that I don't necessarily know what I'm getting into when I start. A shader um but i think yeah just viewing it as like i have this opportunity to just experiment and not worry about the outcome because it's it's not for anything it's just like a little bit of i don't know just i don't want to say showing off but it sort of is i suppose like you're just it's not for anything other than self-gratification November and learning I suppose for mm -hmm. yourself um but yeah just kind of viewing it, it's like this is an opportunity to do anything literally anything and not have to worry about clients or deadlines or just be creative for 30 days so yeah but I've, I've found like uh, watching your your one of your latest entries for November like this art deco mm. pattern creator for example like that yeah like okay. sometimes you go just like abstract and and uh but this is like re really Kind of like a design tool that you created for yourself like mm. pretty practical thing like if you if you're going for uh for an interior design later on you just yeah. can reuse that for that's anything. really interesting one actually because i had the idea for kind of the final form of it with it being quite open with all of the kind of wings unfurled or the petals unfurled and that in my head was like okay i'm aiming for this final result but then once i got there it was like well now i have this option for variability so i can do like straight off, I can do four different variations, but then there's also all of these other values that I've put in to reach this final destination that I can animate or I can change and I can get, you know, hundreds of different results now that are kind of somewhat Art Deco-ish. So it's actually fairly useful. Yeah, like uh, Art Deco from uh, Parallel, un un Parallel Universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, uh, but by, by the way, when it comes to Houdini, you said like an hour is the agony and then you just go. But I, I had an impression um, when it comes to Houdini, mm -hmm. this is my, my, my not informed impression that if you want to do something Houdini, you have to be master of Houdini. Like this is like so much knowledge about this, this coding and math and this way of thinking that you have to you know, kind of go through and this is very, uh, uh, when there's a point that you get a satisfactory result, it's a lot of learning. Is mm. that true? Or? I think you need to understand how Houdini thinks about things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really the only kind of barrier to entry is because obviously it's different to, you know, if you're coming from 3ds Max, then you're not necessarily used to building a node tree or mm -hmm. thinking about things as like, steps in a system and obviously houdini is all about that um but i think yeah to generate something to to generate anything is fairly straightforward but to generate something mm -hmm. specific takes a little bit more mm -hmm. kind of um experimentation and learning i suppose but then it's not like a debilitating amount like i i, I wouldn't pick up houdini if i was in the middle of a project mm -hmm. i would kind of do it at weekends and evenings 
But then I think people look at Houdini like, oh, it's this, it's so powerful, so it must be so complicated. But to mm. actually get into it to begin with, I shouldn't, I, don't, I mean, I don't have a lot of like experience with Houdini myself. I've probably got four or five hours. But, you know, that first hour was like, I don't know anything. I can't even navigate the viewport. And then to getting to like, okay, I can use the interface. And I know where things are. I know how to search for stuff and I can start experimenting. And then a few hours later, it's like, now I have a thing. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a really satisfying place to be in, like to kind of get that excitement for learning. And then, yeah, just like building on it. And there's so much content out there. There's loads of amazing tutorials for Houdini and like obviously communities as well around Houdini. So I think there's, I, I definitely wouldn't view the software being new or novel to you as being a, uh, a barrier it's just that can you can you put in a, a couple of days to get over that initial hurdle <clears throat> mm -hmm. so guys out there don't be afraid of houdini this is not black magic you can just <laughs> try it because I, I because i i've i've i talked to some people and this is like a common like a common i think uh image of houdini for people who don't know much about mm. it like this is that this cutting edge stuff for magicians right yeah i think i think it's a little bit similar to people like wanting, wanting to start uh, i don't know scripting in blender for example in oh, python yeah. they they find that this is like the the black magic barrier because you have to write code and I, <laughs> and you find yourself i don't really write code and then you find out that all you really need to learn is how to copy and paste and place things in order mm -hmm. or maybe just watch uh, like use some templates for your basic things and then there you go and yeah. you are scripting I, think that I would say that i don't know how to script but i've made an add-on for myself before through scripting but it's like okay i can go to the outliner and i can copy like data paths and i can go into the console and i can find yeah, yeah. like there's a there's a really cool cool uh course that uh, sibrin stuvel yeah has done on, on the blender artists, cloud yeah scripting for artists and yeah. And also for the no, uh, like if, if you are searching for something in depth in terms of the November stuff, there there's of course there are awesome tutorials that uh, you are in uh, published on your channel. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Gabe's as well, like CG yeah. Matter is doing dailies right now. So there's a lot of content, and there's also some things on the on the Blender cloud. I think it's in the like you have to be a member yeah. to have the access to this uh, the course that uh, Simon Toms. Did definitely worth the, it though because simon's work is yeah. incredible yeah. and that he's putting it amazing. like in a very structured way so you can really get uh to understand things like how they go yeah so that's that's for you if you're if you're willing to spend a few <clears> bucks <throat> on on pro <laughs> <laughs> blender stuff like that's that I, I find that sometimes a problem for people like you know buying stuff for blender because blender is free itself yeah so there's a lot of like expectation like for everything to be free mm -hmm. for blender people <coughs> which is sometimes i think like uh, a drawback like you know a, you know it's it's awesome that some people are are yeah, like putting out stuff free mm -hmm. it's really like community building but then again it's also important to be able to support creators and you know support yeah. the development of the software i think people forget that a lot it's like well blender is free so i shouldn't i shouldn't have to pay and then there's also the attitude that like how dare you even suggest that i pay and mm -hmm. you see that a lot like i think less so since 2008 we've had like a really big like positive influx of um like professional users so our, the user base is like really professionalized in the last 12 months um, but I think certainly before, whenever, like all of the stuff that I've put out really has been free. And it's just because when I've put stuff out before, I've kind of got messages from people being like, nah, don't, don't be doing this. It's not very Blender of you. But then, yeah, it's just like that attitude and kind of needs to change because people are trying to make a living. <laughs> yeah. I will, I will, yeah. I yeah. always tend to remind myself then of the explanation of the whole open source uh, movement. Like they are always emphasizing that this, this is free software, like free as in freedom, not free as in free beer or free, yeah. free <laughs> lunch. <laughs> not charity software. Yeah. I don't know if you know that uh, 
this plugin uh, Grow EV in 3s Max <clears throat> was closed like two years ago. It was developed from I don't know 15 years, 10 years, a lot of time. It mm-hmm. was free, and the guy who created it uh, closed the the web website. I mean, there is a website, but it's it's it's, it's finished. And the reason was that he got you know there was like the donations uh, system, and he got a donation of one cent, and he just you know it just uh, it just was too much <laughs> like to, uh, it. He said, okay, now, guys, I barely can cover the cost of this website. And, I'm been, and you know, this, this, this uh, plugin was used by every visualization guy company. It was like, oh, uh, really? like really go to the tool. It yeah. was, you could see this grow EV, I, I mean, IV, 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 IVs everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then, yeah, that was like a slap in the, in the face, like, uh, really do want to mock me and so that's very sad that it's 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 uh it's not continued anymore mm. but yeah on the other hand there are some ways to assert like i like i i was thinking about that so what would be um a good solution for that and there are guys who like i think hdr heaven is mm-hmm. working like that there's like this this progress bar of uh donations yeah. if it hits some 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 then there's a new release. If not, then yeah, you can have it for free. And finally, it's it's gathers. And yeah, it's it's funded by the users. Uh, in 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 also in the pace of of how much they want to pay. So if it's really needed, uh, I think that's fair. Mm. But, I mean, if you don't want to just sell, which is also fair. Yeah, I think donationware is. And so um, I don't know if any of you use Gumroad, but that's like a really great platform for creators because they take a very small cut but also it means that you can do donation where um mm-hmm. so i've put stuff out on blender market as well um and there's no that like you can't give stuff away for free on blender market which is i mean it's fine if you're giving away if you're like if you're selling products but then obviously if you do want to do something like oh i just i just have some assets from a tutorial and i want to put them up somewhere and people can donate if they want to so i've done that a couple of times um but i think yeah for for creators and especially since lockdown obviously everybody has become a creator it seems um, yeah so like the yeah just like looking at gumroad saying like oh we've just released like we just reached a new high for the amount of payout we've done this week and it's it's just like amazing to see all the like creators starting to actually get a bit of pocket money for what they're doing rather than it just being like I enjoy doing this and I put it out, but there's no kind of, um, there's no audience, there's no reaction to it. Whereas now people are actually starting to be like, okay, I can, I can pay my rent with this or I can, you know, I can buy a coffee or something like it, even yeah. if it's like a small amount, it's so gratifying knowing that it was like paid for kind of through somebody else. It's, it's, it's fantastic to do things you are passionate about, but being paid uh, decently for the things you are passionate about is like, times 10 of satisfaction <laughs> yes yeah, this, this this connection i mean i don't know but yeah, that's, so, so, that's, a, that's the whole idea behind patreon as well i think yeah mm. like like having people to support you in some kind of a, a more sustainable way yeah mm-hmm. so so on on on, on uh, sketch fab uh, is, is it called sketch fab this this website i mean no sketch i'm sorry google uh, uh, i mean blender go- market Blender market. So on Blender market, it's not possible to put a free content, like a model. Not that I'm aware of. I've tried to put stuff up for free, Mm. and I think the minimum is like two dollars, which is obviously it's a very small amount. But then it Mm -hmm. can also be the barrier for whether or not somebody gets something. And yeah, I mean, on Turbo Squid, you can. I mean, this is also like a way to market your uh, your uh, content. Mm. You get some free samples. uh, people like something you put there. They check ch- check your uh, profile. And, oh, this guy has a lot of cool stuff. Mm-hmm. So, like on 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 Turbo Squid, there's a lot of free stuff, and sometimes it's enough for some kid bashing or whatever you want yeah. to do as some test or whatever. Oh, I, think, I guess I mean there's a lot of choice when it comes to these platforms now. So, so I guess yeah. But I found find that Camrot is, is kind of like the for for small indie creators it's it's 
I think it's the more, most popular right now. Yeah, you know, I've bought some some stuff. I haven't put out anything for sale there, but I've yeah, I've been guilty of buying some stuff there. <laughs> so. It's quite interesting. They've brought out some interesting things. So like you can now, they have a sort of kind of patron patron kind of style thing. So you can like, if somebody puts up a product which is like a recurring payment, then you can essentially pay a subscription to that person, kind of like the Gumroad. Uh, the Gumroad way. But then one of the restrictions of Gumroad is um, if you put out a product, it will not get, it will not turn up in searches or on the discovery page until it gets a review. Um, and I think it's just, that's like a quality checking thing. So, you know, like if you go on Turbo Squid or CG Trader or anything like that, you can yeah. search something. And if you search by free often, or even not searching by free, you end up with a lot of stuff which is kind of, uh, maybe a little bit below the level that you might want for professional work. Um, so you do have to trawl through that. And I think for Gumroad, because they make it so that you can't find stuff unless it's got a review, it's kind of its own quality checking. But it also means that the onus is very much more on the creator to do their own advertising. So kind of two sides. Yeah, I wanted to also ask you about this uh putting out a lot of stuff free and like right now is you said that you've uh also kind of can canceled paid jobs for for the sake of no november like <laughs> that's one month of your <laughs> so so to speak vacation uh, let's let's call it that way <laughs> all, 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 the life. all this time i'm pretty sure I'm that having. you don't get enough rest <laughs> But I wanted to ask you about how, how you managed to balance, balance this out, like uh, the free to versus paid uh, paid content that you release, or is there any kind of like a formula that, that you use for that? Like how much of, of your income you get from freelancing or maybe does this procedural stuff that you do generate generate income? So if, if that's not rude yeah, to ask. No, I, I need to get a better business model. That's... I'm definitely spending more. The mo the money is leaving faster than it's coming in, but hopefully, I'm like I'm pushing YouTube a bit, and maybe that's naive because I'm in such a ridiculously small niche doing blended proceduralism. But I think, you know, like I get some money through from YouTube ads, and I get a little bit of money through from affiliate links, and I get a little bit of money through from Patreon, um, and it does all add up, right? So. I know that I can cover the cost of my food every month just on being a Blender user, which is kind of cool. But then oh, I, I have a really low cost of living. And I think this is, I think uh, you asked a question to your previous guest, uh, the blue in version, I can't remember his name. Um, yeah, you asked him about like one of the challenges of uh, being new versus being like in the game for a long time. And I think like the, uh, the, the point that came to my mind is like, I'm not supporting a family and somebody who's been in the game for 30 years may well have, you know, partner and kids. And that's, mm -hmm. that puts you in a very different ball game financially, because I know that if I have to eat less for a month, and then get like a week of freelancing work or like if I have to go into a studio or something, that's kind of no skin off my back if I'm also pushing my like online presence and I'm getting my business and I'm like, I'm starting things rolling a bit more and I'm experimenting, and I'm learning new skills and I'm like building my credibility as an, as a creator. Whereas if I had, a, if I had kids, I would be absolutely not taking time off work. I would be on the treadmill all the time to try and get in money to make sure that I could support them. And I think that's like a, that's a really big difference between being young, you know, like I'm 25 and I've just finished uni versus being like 40 or 50 and having a family and a house and a mortgage. So, yeah. So uh, to answer your question, I do not have a work-life balance. I just work, <laughs> which is fine. I really enjoy using Blender, so I, I don't feel like um, like I'm at a disadvantage for that. But also, it's like uh, I need to build my brand 
more. My YouTube channel is really small, but my audience is really um, engaged and I feel really like blessed for that. Um, and I, I think when I put out products, even free ones, I do get quite a, a surprising amount of donations. I don't know if that's just sort of the nature of people in this sphere, that they're quite generous, or if that's because people who are looking for procedural stuff is maybe a little bit more few and far between. So, yeah. Trying to make it a feasible business model is a bit of a challenge. I think Blender with geometry nodes and everything nodes and particle nodes and everything is, is moving in kind of my direction. And I don't want to leave Blender. Like I'm really proud of being a Blender user and having used Blender for so long and kind of like being able to call myself a Blender native is like a nice thing. And I do know other software, kind of more in architectural software as opposed to like, you know, like I couldn't pick up Maya or 3DS so much as I could pick up AutoCAD. Um, but then I just want to be pushing Blender and seeing Blender develop and seeing if I can like make, uh, make a living off it. I don't have any kind of illusions about getting super rich or successful, but just to be able to like support myself on creating artwork, creating content, I think that's kind of, that's the place that I want to be in. And I think in 12 months, maybe I will be there. So. Yeah, you know what? Um, I I watched the I watched this this uh, November video and I saw one one thing just 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 blew my mind. It was this this procedural sponge, and it was like this is so much work and thinking, and in, in traditional way, and uh, and when you said that uh, when you are working as a procedural artist, you need to go down to this simple concept like i don't know you have like three four inputs simple inputs like box and then all this transforms mm -hmm. i can see this as a new career or specialization uh, itself mm. if if like like i i saw this sponge stuff this snow stuff and if 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 let's say this is like a huge very big uh, visual effect studio I would love to have a guy like that in the team. Mm. Like I can go, guys, we have this kind of French lava stuff. Okay, Mark, Mark is he's going to do all this kind of stuff just like that. Mm. So I think this is like, uh, I think it's a good way to go and to specialize in. And especially if you have a, like, a, you know, like, a, like a, uh, a thing for that, like you like it, you enjoy this kind of working. I think this is a, this is a very good decision. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not even saying like calculating that it's going to be useful. I think this, like this, this CG is going that way. But when I see the effects of this snow November on the video, and I'm not talking about you know like uh, uh, like this uh, snowman because mm -hmm. the snowman is like a kind of like a look how look what I can create with uh, with these things like even this even snowman. Mm -hmm. So, but there are some stuff which is kind of like a, like a, like a procedural workflow is basically born for that. This yeah. kind of sponge things, this, this quasi Monte Carlo organic stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, if, if you are a guy who just got, got, went to bottom of it, like he understands that he has three output, three inputs and five procedures, five transforms, and mm. that's it. And from that, he can build anything. I think this is a, this is a really fantastic uh, artistic skill. And, and you know, for example, I, uh, I watched some tutorials about, um, about guy who, uh, from, from the film ethics. Film effects. So, so there was, there's a guy who's specialized in this, and this is his, his, his you know, his, uh, his shelf and he works as a fire guy mm -hmm. in in some studios and i was thinking okay i like to play with film effects like uh you know li little pyr pyromaniac in <laughs> yeah i actually thought that it would be good stuff to give to guys in jail for <laughs> fires they just stream this energy by the way, some... by, by the way did, did you notice uh, in one of the videos blender guru uh, andrew price said that he did some kind of like a course for blender in jail like for for 
prisoners there mm -hmm. and they seem to enjoy that like the creative output you know yeah maybe that's a idea. that's a good way but but you know there are the guys who are sitting in jail for setting shit on fire just for the satisfaction so i think they should learn learn <laughs> the effects and the it's piece. over <laughs> Yes, but but you know, I was thinking, okay, what if there is a new software, or, or this is going to be a do, do done in a different way? And this guy, who's of course, I mean, he needs to understand the visual and and like a structure of fire, and of course, this is important. Like he can skip to another software, but now when you set up it, like this this basic concept, this is like a common den denominator for everything, mm. for fume effects, for I don't know, real flow, flow whatever. You are just just guy who 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 have this understanding, and yeah, I think that would I think this is a powerful career move. Mm. I'm I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people needed uh, uh, who has this kind of uh, skills and understanding. I think in um, in in more than just VFX as well. So obviously, if you're working in VFX, then there's a huge number of things that kind of proceduralism is tailored to i think you would probably need to find a bigger studio to be like a specific mm -hmm. you're the fire guy um mm -hmm. as opposed to like just being a generalist who also knows how to do fire um but i think in you know like in architecture in even like in shoe design you see a lot of shoes and like the soles of shoes being designed in grasshopper now um so oh I know it's, I, there's loads of applications for kind of computational design as so like in, in more like physical practical industries it's usually like parametric or computational design and then in CG it's procedural uh, but it's all the same skill set essentially. Yeah, but the, as you said, it's it's uh, I think like um, you know having this time off for for November specifically is mm -hmm. uh, is. It's also like time for you to learn and experiment and I already like looking at some of your entries i think like for example this art deco uh, pattern generator or whatever um, you know not specifically an object uh, thing mm -hmm. but these are already things that you, that could be turned into a product itself like you know just a p procedural wallpaper creator or whatever yeah. something that you that could be sellable for you know for people just wanting to have some kind of a slider based things so just the same thing as as uh, cheyenne did, does right mm -hmm. these cells like procedural shaders that are usable because you know as you said in the working production it's sometimes it's easier to use just a just a texture uh photo photo based texture but then once you get into bigger scale scenes you, mm -hmm. you have the tiling problems so, yeah of course so a lot of like mixing th these techniques with uh with the traditional ones give a lot of uh, you know just just solve solutions for people mm. in a real real working scenario so that could be sellable right so yeah, right now it's, it's it's kind of like you're, you're investing and also like you you mentioned this work and life balance right now when you are in your 20s <laughs> i think i think i've seen a, a nice talk about this uh, i think it was by jordan P peterson or mm -hmm. someone like that uh, who was saying like like this is the time when you're kind of like pushing your limits yeah testing I testing also. your yeah testing your abilities you know pushing the, the learning capabilities of your brain and generally like just like going to the extremes and then the later part of your life you're just like capitalizing on it sort of mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also you have constraints like I like said and I think like this is exactly the thing that you come across uh, talking in the blender nest podcast uh with with blender binge mm -hmm. right <laughs> like he's yeah. being, he being the guy having a family which which i'm also <laughs> in the situation <laughs> of being kind of like uh yeah o already in that constraint period but mm -hmm. uh it gives you some advantages but also you know you have to meet more yeah other types of obligations right so i think it, I, i'm pretty sure that this november is kind of like an investment that will yeah and it, you know like simon did november last year and he was obviously like the one to watch last year simon thomas and yes now he's working for blender yeah so that's, that like... was the funny thing that we had we had him for a live stream on our youtube channel which yeah. was 
t totally a, a big disaster in terms of te technical <laughs> we had issues for half of half of the time but once we got to, to it it was a really good one mm -hmm. so it's available to watch on our channel and it was just like before he got uh, he got employed in the blender institute so we, we kind of got lucky <laughs> having him have time for us <laughs> and this was a good really good uh you know live stream and he showed his uh his approach for procedural and then he just went big time mm -hmm. right so <laughs> we're, we're just we're just joking here because we ha we we are having a small pretty small audience right now here and <laughs> like being a jump start you know, <laughs> place for people maybe maybe there's something like that about us it's, we're, we're just kind of like <laughs> yeah so uh, I'm guessing that uh, we're already like an hour and a half so probably we'll be wrapping things up sure so maybe maybe uh, we could encourage your you know our audience to visit your the places where they can find your work where they can mm -hmm. follow you so yes, you already mentioned you mentioned the Discord channel, which I'm happy I'm, I'm a happy user of. Yes. I highly encourage people to jump in. So, if I could ask Erin, you are in uh, to give a word of encouragement to our listeners to get into procedural thing. Can I ask for it, like uh, as yeah. a as a summarize? So I think proceduralism. It's easy to look at proceduralism as like a gimmick. Um, or just like just a, a kind of a show off thing to make kind of useless shaders like what we're doing for a lot of the vector displacement for November. But then when you combine it with PBR textures, like if I'm doing an interior, I've done like quite a few interior renders where I've only used two, uh, two textures of wood, but like everything in that scene looks like a different kind of wood because it's being manipulated and it's being like you got like herringbone and you've got like straight and then you've got like Versailles patterns and you can do all of these things through procedural manipulation. And it's like, if you want to take your, you know, like what you can do now and just, just turn it up to 11, then that's what learning procedural systems is like. Like you've got all of these skill sets already, you've already banked them and you can already create work at a certain level, but it's just going to give you the freedom to like, to push that to the next to the next level and have the freedom to not have to necessarily look for the exactly right you know texture or the exactly right asset that you can just you can just go and generate them um so i think yeah procedural is so powerful and the barrier for entry is coming down and down and down all the time so mm -hmm. in terms of textures i would probably still recommend substance but if you're using Blender, Blender is very capable. And between uh, procedural textures, and we've got Sverchop for modeling, we've got animation nodes for modeling and animation, we've got, and also visual effects. Um, if you're using Cinema, then you've got like MoGraph in there. And you've got, this is like basically every platform that you have access to probably has some form of procedural uh, way of interacting with it. And it's just, don't be afraid of the maths because it's just like choosing a tool it's not that you need to understand the maths you just need to know how to write the maths and that's something that you'll pick up in just a few minutes of reading a tutorial or watching something so yeah yeah so guys out there don't be afraid of that i guess everybody is already uh, working i don't know in v-ray corona with uh nodes material editor uh it was it's not so it's not so scary it's actually very intuitive intuitive mm. once you try and yeah uh good good idea to go there mm. yeah and especially for blender users out there knowing that blender is really developing in the direction uh, of nodes mm. like the everything nodes project is kind of this is the future also so that if it's better to jump in the wagon sooner because you'll just have advantage after yeah definitely a few years of blender development i've seen a lot of people saying oh i'm not going to learn sverchok because i'm going to wait for everything nodes and it's such a fallacy to think that these platforms are like completely discrete from one another the thinking is identical and the maths is identical and the 
often the tool names are also identical. It's just like the way that you plug nodes together might be different. So learn a platform as soon as you can because it's going to be transferable. A good, good, good uh, um, advice for people who are procrastinating <laughs> with that. So yeah, thank you a lot for your time, Irene. It was yeah. a very interesting talk and for all the insights uh, from the from the cutting edge battleground of CG. Mm, thanks so much for having me on. It's been it's been an honor. Okay, so see you guys around and keep rendering. <laughs> Blending. <laughs> okay. Or noding or noding. <laughs> noding. Right? Keep, yeah. keep on, keep on okay. tweaking those nodes, you know. Moving yep. the sliders. See you later, guys. <laughs>